In today's news, Commonwealth Parliamentary Association team here to strictly observe and not to participate in the election process. A man recovering from a gunshot wound sustained in Cane Garden Bay on Sunday. But the Progressive Virgin Islands Movement at Large candidate Shana Smith Archer speaks on overhaul needed to fix infrastructure and BVI CCHA and higher BVI hosting business continuity planning initiative. But these and more stories when 284 News return. For the last several years, I have had the distinct pleasure of getting to know Mrs. Lorna Smith OBE on both a personal and professional level. She's my mentor and she's my friend, and I owe so much of who I am, especially professionally, to her. Her work ethic, her determination, and her passion have rubbed off on me, and because of that, I have been able to succeed in many aspects of my life. Being a young professional in the BVI, I do think it's always special to have someone who will put you in the important rooms and allow you to learn and to grow, allow you to be the best version of yourself. She was instrumental in helping me to be confident in my abilities. She has a thing where she says that I inspire her, but I don't think she understands how much she inspires me on a daily basis. She cares, she understands, she's passionate, and she listens. Her care, her passion, and her love of all that she does are just a few of the reasons I think that you should vote for her. We are at a time in the BVI where we need doers and not just talkers. I can vouch for Lorna Smith because she is a doer and she will always fight to ensure that the BVI gets the very best. She's someone we need right now and I am telling you here today, she can do it. On 24th April, 2023, I will be voting for Lorna Smith and you should too. Well, welcome viewers to the Wednesday, April 19th edition of 284 News. I am Kamal Haynes, bringing the latest out of the British Virgin Islands. While well, leading today's news, legal political analyst of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association mission, Anne Maraboro, has made it clear that the purpose of her team's presence during the election period is to strictly observe the process and not interfere with the proceedings. Well, the CPA team held a press conference to address members of the public and the media on Tuesday, April 18th, after arriving in the territory on Monday. As the name suggests, our role is one strictly of observation. We're here to observe the election. We're not here to participate in the process itself in any way. Our role is a passive one. We, we won't be interfering with the process at all in any way. We have a consolidated method methodology that governs our work, that, that's long established, and we abide by the Declaration of Principles uh, for International Election Observation. The CPA BIMR is a signatory, a party, to this Declaration of Principles observed by election observers around the world. So ourselves and our colleague observers, we all really act impartially, professionally and with integrity. It's important to stress that our role isn't one of assessment or comment about the politics, about the political outcome of this election. Instead, what we focus on is the quality of the election, the, the operational modalities of the election. We're really looking at the conformity of the electoral process with the domestic and international frameworks that govern the elections here in the British Virgin Islands. Omar Barra also details some of the key areas that will be observed over the upcoming days. Our observation also includes um, every aspect from uh, opening of polls to the casting of the votes to the counting of the votes, but we also look broadly at the legal and political context for the elections. So the areas that we address in our observation are the following. We look at the legitimacy and the credibility of the elections. So for us, that's all about inclusion. Just how inclusive is the election? Is there equal opportunity to participate? And we look finally at the transparency of the process. Well, election observation lead Fleur Ten Hacking revealed some of the stakeholders that, will, that her team will be interacting with while on the island and disclose the steps that will be undertaken right after the conclusion of the election. We will be meeting with key election stakeholders, um, that includes the supervisor of elections and her team, political parties, political candidates, polling station staff and voters. 
Um, and we will also be meeting with a wide range of representatives from different professions, as well as with civil society. And in addition, we will be attending election related events and monitor the campaign and the media. Our preliminary findings um, will be shared just after election day, so on Wednesday the 26th of April, and we'll host a press conference to uh, announce our preliminary statement at 3 p.m. on that day. Um, and then finally, within two months of election day, we will publish our final report, and that report will be more in-depth and will also include some recommendations on potentially how the process could be improved going forward. Um, these recommendations that we offer are for the consideration of the people of the British Virgin Islands and it is up to you to take these forward. Well, meanwhile, the head of the CPA Mission Honourable Fatoumata Nejer Nam revealed the full team that will be on the grounds during the election period. Please allow me to introduce you to the core team which consists of Vasil Vashanka, the electoral campaign analyst from Sweden, he's right, be right behind you, mm -hmm. and Marlboro, our legal political analyst from Ireland, Matthew Hamilton, CPA BIMI mission coordinator from the US, and Flo Ten Hacken, CPA BIMI election observation lead from the Netherlands. We will also be joined by three short-term observers, Honorable Shayla Rogers Webster from Anguilla, Honorable Randy Howell from the Talks and Caucus Islands, and Honorable Samantha Sacramentos from Gibraltar. Residents interested in contacting members of the CPA mission team can do so via their email address, that is cpabimr at parliament.uk. Well, a male is presently recovering at the Dr. D. Orlando Smith Hospital after sustaining a gunshot wound while in Cane Garden Bay on Sunday. The Royal Virgin Islands Police Force confirmed the incident via a statement on Tuesday, April 18th. But they said, and I quote, the police can confirm that a male received a gunshot wound on Sunday evening while in the Cane Garden Bay area. His injury is not believed to be life-threatening. The police investigations are ongoing, end quote. But while no other information was provided from the Royal Virgin Islands Police Force, secondary reports indicate that the injured man is a non-national. But more to come on this story as it continues to develop. Well, in a recent interview feature for 284 Media's Just for the Record Election Series program, Progressive Virgin Islands Movement candidate Shana Smith-Archer discussed what is needed for an overhaul of the Virgin Islands infrastructure. I think the first thing I would do is that we have to overhaul the Public Works Department. That's where it needs to start, because this is the entity that's responsible for the construction and maintenance of our road network. And if they have the proper staffing, so engineers, architects, um, as well as the labor force and the money to go ahead and do that. I think that's the key role that I need to play as a policymaker that makes sure that the public service can do what it's supposed to do. So once those things are in place now, you're able to have the engineers now do proper road design where we have the drainage, we have proper markings on our road. And again, from the budget process, we make sure that we're funding the things that we need to. With the roads, we have to also be patient and know that to get proper roads, we actually have to plan a three to five year project. We like things done instantaneously, but in this case, because of the lack of maintenance or lack of the right construction in the first place. You know, for example, I tell people with the situation with um, a lot of the coastal roads, like in East End, those areas are actually reclaimed land. Mm -hmm. So what that means now is that the groundwater is springing and it's underneath the road bed. And that's what's part of what's causing the erosion as well as on the surface. So we put tar down on dirt <laughs> and the water is coming up and water is running off and eventually you have no more roads and we have canyons um, in the middle of the road that is damaging my car, mm -hmm. Ron. Mm -hmm. You know, and I know everybody <laughs> ha at some point last year had to go into the garage yes. to replace shocks and struts and I was one of them. So it is something where it is not beyond us, but we have to properly resource the departments and whatever we don't, we need to outsource now, you know, in terms of hiring companies. I mean, that project to me is like, if we, we have an unemployment problem, like we can employ people for five years steady. 
just doing road works. And we see it all the time in the yes. U.S. Because it's something where, again, you, you map out the entire system, determine what the specific issues are. Some areas might be drainage. Some areas might be, we just need to take off the asphalt top because the concrete base is still good. Well, Smith, who is an engineer by profession, outlined what she would do to support scholarships in engineering and other key areas of study. Definitely, we're not doing enough. And I say that because when we look at the budget, and I think last year's budget or the current year's budget, um, if, I, if I heard the Minister of Education correctly, it was only 13%. So when we talk about wanting to develop our people, it starts with the education system. And the system is not just the schools, it is things like scholarships. So I sat on the scholarship committee from 2019 up until 2022 last year. And I, I definitely didn't see enough of the technical fields come through in terms of applicants. And one, one of the things I would lobby for and, and say we need to put in place is that you have national scholarships that are dedicated to certain fields. Okay. So just like we see the Sheving Scholarship out of the U yes. UK that says you have to study these five areas and we will basically fund your education. We need to start to put money into the scholarship fund that says this is what it should do. And again, we had, <laughs> we've had several things over the years. There was a scholarship fund that was initially funded, I believe it was by the Caribbean Development Bank, but it wasn't managed in a sustainable way. So it has been inactive for quite some time now. Because the idea is that persons would be able to get monies from the scholarship fund, and when they return and work, they would pay back into the fund, and then the fund now would pay for scholarship for others. So we have to start to do things and manage it in a very sustainable way. We also have to take all public service training and development from inside of the same pot of money, because that was one of the things that surprised me. I knew from working in the service about study leave, and it should have been a separate budget, and I think it was. But what I realized sitting in the scholarship committee is that students were competing with the professionals in the public service or other professionals, um, I should say, because it's um, a national program, yes. right? So we have to take seriously the amount of money that needs to be invested um, annually as well as long term, because it's a long game we're playing when it comes to developing our country, and it has to start with the people. Well, Smith also addressed additional issues affecting the way of life for persons in the territory while sharing her take on issues such as abortion, same-sex marriage, and the legalization of marijuana. Abortion. I support the legality of it in instances where the life of the mother and the child are, or and or the child would be affected. The legalization or decriminalization of marijuana. I would support that. Okay. And I, I say that in, in terms of, again, any legislation that is brought, there has to be parameters around what is done. Anything that we legalize, whether it was, you know, it's alcohol or marijuana, we have to know that certain things can be abused. So okay. there is always going to be that risk of abuse. And I think that is what people fear when they hear about, you know, legalizing marijuana. For the full interview, visit all TWIC4 media platforms. Well, up next, BVI CCHA and Higher BVI hosting business continuity planning initiative. And the BVI finished second in under 15 football tournament with Anguilla crowned champions. But these are more stories after a word from our sponsors. I decided to run for election because I believe that for the BVI, our best days are yet ahead. Why do I believe that? Because as I have said many times that despite our differences, there are certain things that define us. We are resilient. We are compassionate. We are entrepreneurial. We believe in one BVI and we believe in a better tomorrow for us all. The job of the government is to empower us to fulfill that ambition. We can all see the problems we face, and we heard some of them from our chairman. With our infrastructure, with crime, 
with the challenges of our young people, the cost of living, and I could go on and on. But I can promise you that if you vote for me and the National Democratic Party, we will be laser focused on solutions. Our country has more power with Lana in Wicana. The future looking brighter with Lana in Wicana. Sincere with honesty, but you know that already. We representation from a hard working woman. Right now, we need Lusa Smith right now. Right now, we need Lusa Smith right now. Vote for Lusa on election day. Vote district ain't no other way. We tired, complain. We've been left out in the rain. We ain't got no time to waste no more. Oh, 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 oh. Voting Lusa Hat Smith for sure. Oh, 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 oh. Got me singing like. Welcome back, viewers. What the, the Department of Disaster Management will facilitate an upcoming workshop series in business continuity planning hosted by BVI CCHA in partnership with Higher BVI. Our participants will learn how to develop a plan of action to aid in the prevention and recovery of potential threats to a business. Well, in a recent interview, President of Business at the Chamber, Ms. Lavina Libbard, spoke on the importance of the workshop series. Oh, it's essential. It's essential um, to make sure that your business can continue in some way in the event of a natural disaster mm -hmm. or a personal setback. Uh, a lot of times, and I was actually just thinking about this for my own business, okay. you know, especially if you're a solo entrepreneur, no one else might have access to your passwords. You may be in the cloud. You mm -hmm. may have a physical place of business. Um, no one else may have access to that. So there's, there's a lot that goes into it. And obviously, the Department of Disaster Management has some key points okay. that they're going to be laying out for business owners. And we really encourage not just small businesses. I know probably a lot of the larger businesses probably already have their business continuity plans in place and have redundancies yes. where a number of employees you know, may have you know, a line of command may have access to take care of things in the event of a disaster. But I'm really looking forward myself to participating and learning from the Department of Disaster Management on this and getting their perspective on the key things we have to think about. A corporate trainer at Higher BBI, Ms. Kadian Ferguson, outlined the re registration process and costs. We are continuing our efforts to do what we can to help to elevate businesses in the BVI. Um, the majority of the economic structure here outside of our financial services sector is made up of small businesses. Mm -hmm. um, and these small businesses can be in the sense that we have between one and 10 employees. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times these businesses tend to overlook some of the basics that they need to do. Business continuity is one of these things. Mm -hmm. Based on our geographical location, we know that we are prone to hurricanes. Yes. If your business is flooded, what happens? Um, if you are unable to access your physical files, mm -hmm. how do you continue to work? Um, uh, we have seen um, that in the light of COVID, we have become a lot more flexible in how we conduct our business, but that's not necessarily enough. We need to put structures and plans in place. So in the event that anything happens, not just an actual disaster, mm -hmm. that our business is able to continue and to flourish. Wonderful. That's what's important. And we continue to work with the Chamber of Commerce to highlight some of the challenges that we see our clients having mm -hmm. and whatever we can do to help them to elevate their business to take it to the next level, we're happy to do so. Additionally, the public was notified of additional workshops to be held by both agencies. So the event is going to be hosted on April 26th at Higher BVI's training room. It is going to be facilitated by the Department of Disaster Management. They're going to be coming in and talking about the framework of how to create uh, um, a business continuity plan. There's also a template that they have okay. that they will be sharing with participants as well. So really, it is going to allow you to start the process of understanding how do I create a business continuity plan? Yes. What is a business con continuity plan yes. and why is it important for my business and how do I implement it in my business? It is not a one size fits all mm -hmm. approach because right. businesses are diverse. 
we have different organizational structures and it is important for us to understand where our strengths and weaknesses lie and once we identify these things we're then able to put safeguards in place to ensure our business continuity for persons who are unable to make the event you are encouraged to have a representative from your team to attend so the cost is $150 because we are now outside of our early bird window, okay. unfortunately. Yes. So for non-chamber members, it is $150. And then for chamber members, it is only $125. All right. And again, that is going to be held at the uh, Higher BBI training room in uh, Fish Bay. Yes. And that is from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. on that is April correct. 26th. April 26th. Yes. Registration yes. closes on the 24th. So we need to know from now mm -hmm. before spaces fill up your interest in coming. Ideally, you want to ensure you have key personnel attending if the business owner is unable to attend themselves because we do understand that you may have other uh, responsibilities and other commitments mm -hmm. for that time. So ensure you have key personnel, maybe your operations manager, your general managers, if you have a vice president, directors, whatever the structure of your business allows, ensure you have key personnel that are integral to the continuity of your business, attend the session, and then they can actually pass on the information to the rest of your team or maybe even um, schedule a one-on-one -on -one session with the Department of Disaster Management Correct. to come in and speak with the entire team on how to build on the foundation that they would have helped you set during the workshop. Well, for the full interview, visit all 284 media platforms. Well, the British Virgin Islands under-15 boys team finished second in the just-concluded BVI Football Association Triangular Tournament, which was won by an unbeaten Anguilla team. With the Anguillans, after winning their previous three games, including a 2-0 victory over the BVI, held on to end the tournament with a 100% win record after defeating the BVI 1-0 in the final game of the competition at the East End Long Luck Football Stadium on Sunday. But that was the second defeat experienced by Team BVI from Anguilla, who had previously defeated the home side 2-0. For Team BVI, they recorded two wins over the United States Virgin Islands in their earlier games with O'Neill Gillings scoring their only goal in a 1-0 win that set up the grand finale with Anguilla. But the BVI initially opened the tournament with a 6-0 victory over the neighboring United States Virgin Islands with a double from Kyle Farrington, while Tomari Nanton, Blake Kirk, Gillings and Jaheem Bajai each tallied a goal. But the USVI finished the tournament winless in third position. But the Golden Boot Award went to Nicholson, um, Nicholson Millington of Anguilla for his two goals in the tournament, while his teammate Shamar Brown won the Golden Glove. But the most valuable player of the tournament went to the BVI's O'Neill Gillings, who also had two goals in the tournament. Well, up next, CARICOM has declared a war on guns and 13 named storms, six hurricanes predicted for 2023. Are well, these stories with Twit 4 News Return? I am Carl Dawson, Virgin Islands Party District 1 candidate. I am here at the Theresa Blyden Clinic in Capoons Bay. This clinic services Capoons Bay, Long Bay, Carrot Bay, Towers, West End areas. They tell me that they have a client base of over 2,000. The space is small, but they do the very best that they could. Healthcare is one of the key issues that we must attend to in these coming years. We have a plan to build a polyclinic here at Capoons Bay. It has been talked about for years, but now I think it must be a reality. The services that could be available would be more extensive than are here now and would allow persons in the district or elderly or youth to have services right here, as well as decrease the pressure on the services in Road Town. So this is one project that I would love to see move forward and I'll be working hard to ensure that it happens. Working hard for everyone, I ask you to support me, Carl Dawson, in District 1.
Well, welcome back viewers and thank you so much for sticking with us. Well, CARICOM has declared a war on guns. With this, as the CARICOM heads emerged from a two-day regional symposium to address crime and violence as a public health issue. Well, the official declaration stated, and I quote, We declare a war on guns to combat the illegal trade which provides the weapons that contribute significantly to crime and violence in our region, causing death, disabilities, and compromising the safety of our citizens. We call on the United States of America to join the Caribbean in our war on guns and urgently adopt and take action to stop the illegal exportation of firearms and ammunition into the Caribbean. Well, as the regional leaders lament the disproportionate share of our national budgets that we are compelled to allocate to measures uh, to address crime, violence, and national security, as well as mental health and other health-related challenges that directly result from the illegal exportation of guns to our region. CARICOM underscored its continued commitment to, and I quote, utilize all human, financial, and other resources to rid the region of the scourge of illicit weapons, end quote. But a note also continued by stating, we reiterate that the Caribbean must be a zone of peace which will allow us to achieve our goal of a secure, stable, and prosperous community for all other citizens. I'm sorry, that's all our citizens, end quote. Well, action in this regard has kicked off with a decision to ban automatic rifles in the entire region. What CARICOM said, and I quote, CARICOM heads have agreed today to take a decision to ban the use and presence of assault weapons in the civilian population of our nations, revealed Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, Dr. Keith Rowley. Well, Dr. Rowley explained further that the move is necessary at this time to ensure that the situation in the region does not continue to escalate. Well, moving on to our final story, viewers where meteorologists have predicted 13 named storms for the 2023 Atlantic hurricane season, with six expected to be strong enough to be dubbed hurricanes. Well, this was shared during the Tropical Weather Conference by Dr. Philip Klotzbach of the Tropical Meteorology Project of Colorado State University. Well, according to Dr. Klotzbach, this early 2023 outlook is based on current conditions, which suggests slightly below average activity during this season. However, he noted that this forecast has come with, and I quote, considerable uncertainty, end quote. But the forecast explained that sea surface temperatures in the eastern and central Atlantic are considerably warmer than usual, which means that potential, potential exists for a busy Atlantic hurricane season. However, it is also possible that a robust El Nino could develop. But in a statement on Friday, the Department of Disaster Management reminded that as the official start of the hurricane season approaches on June 1st, persons are reminded to monitor local weather reports, which are shared daily via the DDM app, website, and social media channels. When updates to these channels are regular and become more frequent when a, simps, when a system poses a potential threat. But notwithstanding predictions for low activity this season, the Department of Disaster Management continues to urge residents of the Virgin Islands to carry out storm preparedness measures in order to best protect lives and property. What suggested preparedness activities include creating or updating an emergency plan, inspecting structures for leaks, ensuring shutters and drainage paths are in good condition, stocking an emergency supply kit with food, water and medications, and reviewing any insurance policies. But that's all for today's news roundup. Be sure to follow us for daily news updates at twit4media.com and like us on Facebook at twit4media and twit4bvi on Instagram and Twitter. I'm Kamal Haynes and I'll see you again tomorrow. Have a safe and enjoyable evening. Bye-bye. Mm. Is that my lunch? Hmm? Is that my lunch? Mm -mm. We're like the co-worker that doesn't eat your lunch. I'm John. I'm John. CG Insurance. Good like that. The wait is over! CCT Fire is here! Experience ultra-fast downloads, seamless streaming, and even more reliable connectivity on an all-new fire-blazing, super-fast CCT Fire network. CCT Fire, bring it home and upgrade today.